This lesson deals with the National Association of Broadcasters Equalizer. You can find these notes in the ECE202 ebook in Chapter 11, starting on page 19. In order to optimize the recording process for tape recorders, low frequency tones are attenuated and high frequency tones are amplified when a tape is made. In playing back the tape, we have to reverse this recording process. To ensure uniformity, the National Association of Broadcasters, or just NAB for short, has specified the following transfer function for tape recorder playback equalization. Transfer function would be S times S plus 11.121K divided by S plus 62.83 and then S plus 314. There's a similar problem in recording vinyl records and the equalization curve is a little bit different. Let's take a look at how I might realize this particular transfer function. If I use our inverting amplifier, it's a ratio of two impedances. So if I could break this apart into two impedances whose ratio would form this, then I could make the transfer function by using the inverting amplifier. Suppose I take the 0 S plus 11.121K and this pole S plus 62.83. What's left over then is this term and this term, but I'm going to take Z2 and divide it by Z1. So this will become my 0 of Z1 and this will become my pole of Z1. When you form the ratio then we have our transfer function T of S. Now the impedance Z2 is an improper rational function. So let's do long division and let's get it into a proper rational function form. S plus 62.83 divided into S plus 11,121 would go once. One times this would be S and then 62.83. Subtracting these two, I get 11.05817K. They could write Z2 then as 1 plus the remainder divided by S plus 62.83. Referring back to our last video, this would be the term R of infinity. That was just going to be 1 ohm. And then what I've got here is a parallel R and C. And we said that the C was the reciprocal of the residue, which is 11.05817K. It turns out to be 90.43 microfarads. The resistor is equal to the residue divided by the pole, and that turns out to be 176 ohms. We likewise need to do this also for Z1, so let's divide the denominator into the numerator. This will just go 1, so that'd be S, the remainder would be 314. So you could write Z1 as 1 plus 314 over S. And again, this would be our R of infinity, which is just 1 ohm. And then our second term is 314 divided by S, which is simply the impedance of a capacitor whose value is 1 over 314. That turns out to be 3,185 microfarads. So now we can form our op-amp circuit where here's Z1 and here's Z2. Could write a SPICE file for this, like we did in ECE201. You'd have a title, dot end, and then you need to describe the schematic. There's no ideal op-amp in the program, so we'll need to introduce a voltage-controlled voltage source, like we did in ECE201. Let's put this all together then. So I've got a voltage source here between node 1 and ground. Let's make that a value of 1. So my output voltage divided by my input voltage is just the output voltage. Resistor R sub A is between nodes 1 and 2, has a value of 1 ohm. C sub A is between 2 and 3, has a value of 3,185 microfarads. The resistor R sub B is between 3 and 4, has a value of 1 ohm. Capacitor C sub B is between 4 and 5 and has a value of 90.43 microfarads. And then the resistor R sub C is between 4 and 5 and has a value of 176. Our op amp will replace again with a voltage control voltage source. So here's the connection at node 3 and then ground. And then we're going to have a gain that we'd like to be infinite. We'll have to pick a finite number since this device program won't accept infinity. So let's just use 100 million. First node is the plus node of the controlled source. The second is the second terminal, which would be ground. We're sensing from terminal 0 to 3, so 0 to 3, and then the gain of 100 million. Dot probe will give us the access to all the variables in our circuit. And then let's do a plot, say, from 1 hertz to 100 kilohertz and do 40 points per decade. So we'll have about 200 points on the screen. In the program will have the results on the next page. You can see here that we're getting an increase in the gain at low frequencies and then basically passing the signal at high frequencies. So just the opposite of what was done in the recording process. Suppose I want to build a circuit we just designed. We'll see later in the curriculum, especially in ECE402, that for op amp circuits to work well non-ideally, we need to pick the resistors and capacitors carefully. For those that are taking ECE203, you may have seen some of these ideas, but let me just tell you what you need to do. If you pick resistors between 1K and 10 mega ohms, you'll generally avoid some problems due to the non-ideal op amp and the non-ideal elements. Now the reason for this is that when the resistance is much smaller than 1K, you draw currents that can exceed the maximum allowable of the output of the op amp. Resistors generate noise, and that noise depends on the bandwidth of the circuit and also the value of resistance. So as the resistance goes up and the bandwidth goes up, the noise that the resistor generates goes up. 
If you go above this value, the noise that's generated by the resistance may swamp out the signal that you're trying to amplify. For capacitors, staying between 100 picofarads and 0.1 microfarads can also avoid some problems. Less than 100 picofarads, we get into the stray effects of the pins of the op amp itself and maybe the printed circuit board you're building it on. When the capacitors get bigger than 0.1 microfarad, we're starting to look at electrolytic capacitors, and they don't have the greatest characteristics for filtering. Clearly, if we try to build a circuit we just synthesized, we're going to have some problems with it. Let me introduce an idea called impedance scaling. Our transfer function is a ratio of two impedances. Now, if you multiply every impedance in a circuit by a scale factor, you can actually factor that out in front. Let's do a simple example. Suppose you have two 1K resistors in series. Now double their values, so you got 2K plus 2K. So you went from 2K, series combination, to 4K. The resistance you had before is now twice as big. The same factory multiplied each resistance. So if you have a chain of impedances and do the same thing, the same thing will happen. We'll go through a more formal proof in ECE404. If you can pull out the scale factor of each impedance, they'll cancel in the ratio, and you'll still get the same transfer function. Let's see if that actually works. Now what happens when you multiply a resistor by a scalar? Well, it just simply gets larger by that scalar. Now if you multiply the impedance of a capacitor by a scalar, you could then write that as 1 over SC divided by K. In other words, it looks like C is K times smaller. Let's try a scale factor of 47,000 and see what happens. So we take our 1 ohm resistor and multiply it by 47K, and we get a 47K resistor. Likewise for R sub B, and for R sub C, we're multiplying 176 by 47K, get about 8.272 megaohms. Getting a little bit on the high side, but still, let's see if we can build our circuit with this. For the capacitor, multiplying by a scale factor K for every impedance, we would be making the capacitor K times smaller. That would make the 3,185 microfarad capacitor become 67.77 nanofarads. And likewise, the 90.43 microfarad capacitor becomes 1.924 nanofarads. They can't get exactly these values of capacitance, and likewise this value resistance, but try to come as close as you can. And then this circuit's not that critical to component values. Let's get the overall shape that we need. Take these values and rerun the last simulation, replacing our resistors and our capacitors with the values we just solved for. And you can see here I get exactly the same result I had before. So I'm amplifying the low frequency tones, and I'm pretty much passing the high frequency tones. This is the design and analysis of a National Association of Broadcasters Equalizer.